Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our next session. As multinational companies have established clear carbon neutral targets, the company's fleets, of course, need also to contribute. And as fleet managers seek efficiency, it can be that connected technology is of support. Now, looking a little bit forward, we can also imagine that one of the most dramatic and drastic transitions that our industry will have to overcome is linked to autonomous transportation. And so probably it's better for corporate fleet managers that they anticipate than they react. Now, in this panel discussion, we would like to reflect on the three topics with three bright minds, three corporate fleet managers, and let's hope that on some of the topics, they will disagree. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our three corporate fleet managers for this panel expert discussion. We have Jonathan Caymans, Associate Director Fleet and Safety at Boringer Ingelheim. We have Yulia Lapenkova, Global Senior Procurement Manager Vehicles at Danone and recently elected European Fleet and Mobility Manager of the Year 2021. And the third expert speaker in this panel is Carlo Rietveld. He is the Global Category Manager Mobility Services at Ericsson. So welcome, welcome to the session. We have a few topics that we would like to discuss. But first of all, I would like to do a quick tour and with all of you, and that is that you can describe a little bit how big is your fleet and what your exact role is. And I would like to start with Julia. Hi, Steven. Um, my name is Julia, uh, as you just mentioned. I'm a global buyer responsible for fleet company ban in Danone. So basically, I'm a part of a global procurement team who is uh, very closely working with the global HR team. So, that, so those are two people driving all the initiatives about the fleet from the global perspective. And we look after around 14,000 cars, which is both tool cars and uh, benefit cars with a ratio of 70 to 30 respectively. Uh, we are present in more than 40 countries and more than, more than half of the fleet is located in Europe. Okay, perfect. Carlo, do you also have roughly 14,000 vehicles? Is it less? Is it more? It's less. We are globally about 8,500 vehicles. Uh, the majority of vehicles, of course, being within Europe, I think about 45%. And we have a split between 60-40% between service fleet and benefit vehicles. Um, I'm responsible or part of a global category team. Uh, mobility service, as mentioned, um, my main responsibility lies within Europe, the European fleet, also be having the biggest fleet and also having the biggest benefit fleet. Um, and Ericsson's present in approximately 140 countries. Okay. It's interesting that uh, within your function is already mobility services. Does this mean that also to the future, you will probably introduce more and more alternative mobility solutions? Uh, yes, that's something we're looking into. Uh, part of our category is also ground transportation, as we call it, or short-term rentals. And that's why it's beyond leasing and all the car manufacturers. It also includes ground transportation already. So perhaps that's already the first step looking into mobility services. But mobility service for us, indeed, is something we want to look into in the future. Although bearing in mind that 60% of our fleet is operational oriented, it will be difficult to give a field service engineer a mobility card and strap with an antenna to his back. Uh, but for sure, it's something we are looking into and are uh, pursuing in the future. Okay. And then, Jonathan, Jonathan, you are based in North America. Can you describe your function and the size of your fleet? Sure. Uh, BI has a global fleet of uh, 13,300 vehicles, of which 3,200 of those sit in the U.S., with about another 280 in Canada. So I am based in the U.S., actually uh, permanently remote out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and our operations are primarily sales in the U.S., both on the animal health side and the pharmaceutical side. And then we have a small benefit fleet as well. Um, as far as my responsibilities, it's really the development of fleet strategy for the organization and then um, really making the connections into the organization through you know, HR, legal, risk management, um, all of those functions to ensure that we're winning across the organization as it relates to what those fleet goals are. 
And we see in your function, in your title, that there is the combination of fleet and safety. So does this mean that you also have a direct responsibility around safety? It, it does. So that, that was actually a change for the organization as I came on board, was really taking a, a more direct approach as to how we combine the fleet and safety function and really start to drive safety um, more specifically as it relates to um, mobility and fleet. Okay, very good. Uh, one of the topics that we already discussed this morning is related to carbon neutral targets. You are working for three multinational companies. I can imagine that also your companies, from a, from a corporate perspective, have clear uh, carbon neutral targets. Julia, can you elaborate a little bit about what those carbon neutral targets are and how is this translated into the fleet? Yeah. Uh, Danone has a very extensive CSR agenda as many corporates, and we have already a lot of initiatives in other categories, direct categories also connected with our farmers, because this is also the critical part of the business for Danone. And recently we started looking at other categories because we need to take each and every nuance into account. Um, fleet is something very important in our view, because this is right there on the surface and we cannot ignore it. As of 2021, we launched a new global car policy where we uh, declared global sustainability targets, which is quite a brand new and innovative clause because it was a top-down approach. But anyways, it should be a very smart approach as well because we know that in more than 40 countries where we have fleet, we have completely different situations and we cannot just ignore market specifics. So that's why we just decided to have a, a little bit of a complex multi-level target, but covering all the needs. Basically, we have a global vision of Danone so that we committed actually to decrease our CO2 uh, mileage-based CO2 emissions by 30% by 2025, and it should be revised further on. Then we have, and this is valid for all the countries, right, based on their baseline. Then we should, and we have done this, we have kept CO2 emissions gram per, per kilometer per car for everybody, both for two cars and uh, benefit cars. But also knowing that markets are completely different, we decided to go bolder for European region, meaning that we go fully electric and hybrid cars as of 2022 for European uh, markets, um, starting with orders, of course. We are not able to renew all the fleet immediately, but we start ordering only electric or hybrid cars in the European market as of 2022. Okay, good. Um, Carlo, within Ericsson, you already mentioned that the majority of your fleet are uh, tool cars. Um, I can imagine that it's perhaps not so easy to translate the carbon neutral targets of your company into your fleet. Is that correct? And can you elaborate a little bit on that? No, that is correct. That is a challenge uh, because uh, there are not a lot of electric uh, possibilities out there looking at the LCD and van segment. Uh, but we are still looking at how we can uh, bring our carbon footprint down also for those activities. First of all, by looking at our requirements that we put on the table for our vehicles. And the bigger the vehicle, the more weight, the more carbon emitting they are, but also at our own operations on how we handle tickets. Uh, of course, we're in a the telecommunication world, so a lot of activities we're doing are becoming more and more automated, more remote, for artificial intelligence, robotics, meaning less movement uh, in that perspective. Um, so, and then also looking at putting carbon caps on, 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 uh, on our fleet uh, vehicles as well, saying specific driving towards our carbon footprint reduction targets, which Ericsson has as well. Uh, we want to be uh, actually a net zero emission uh, by 2030 in our own activities. So actually fully based on our own activities, not offsetting a lot of things. Uh, so we're looking on uh, 2022, 20, 2023, 20, but beyond as well 2030 to uh, gradually go to net zero emitting. And also, like I said, looking at our requirements and hopefully we will have more possibilities and opportunities uh, coming out of the market as well from common manufacturers looking at LCD in one segment. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, uh, we always have had the impression that uh, sustainability, carbon neutrality, and North America, until, let's say, recently, that was not the perfect match. Is that correct? And perhaps now, with everything that is going on also in North America, the investments that are announced, uh, the things that are asked 
to companies to do in terms of sustainability? Do you see a change in North America and also within your company? I, I do. And in fact, it's, it's a really good question. So joining BI this January, one of the first discussions we had was really what is fleet's impact to the greater organization's goal to you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to create you know, carbon neutrality by 2030. Um, and, and the initial discussion was, hey, you know, from a US perspective, we understand it's not possible. And, and that's when I challenge everyone to kind of relook at what that opportunity looks like, right? Can we do it holistically across the fleet by 2030? N not likely, but if you look at the US economy, you look at the direction of the current administration, and you look at some of the you know, new tax benefits to the organization, um, there's opportunities for sure. So it, in a couple of weeks, we had kind of mulled over what that might look like, looked at the actual numbers, and from a U.S. perspective, uh, committed that 30% of our fleet would be battery electric uh, by 2030. Okay. Um, let's continue with electrification. Um, Carlo, you already mentioned that, of course, when you have a tool fleet that perhaps is a little bit more challenging than when you have only passenger cars to manage. But... Um, you have a fleet, a global fleet, also an APEC. You have quite an important size of your fleet. Uh, is it reasonable to think that you can electrify your fleet across all the regions? No, I don't think so. Uh, you need to do it on a, uh, how do you say, step-by-step -step approach, uh, for sure. And some, some markets are ready to be uh, fully deployed with electric vehicles. They have the right infrastructure. Some markets are not. Uh, so you need to look at it on a market by market and country by country basis, uh, to be quite honest. And then, you know, we evaluate on a yearly basis because for sure those countries will evolve as well. And when the time is right, you can introduce electric vehicles there as well, or even plug-in hybrids, right? There are more, um, more roads that lead to Rome, uh, to be honest. So you just need to find a step-by-step -step approach driving down your CO2 targets. It's not like you can implement, you know, electrification throughout the globe, just like a big bang implementation. You need to do it in phased, uh, within a phased approach. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia, you were talking uh, at the beginning about that you also need to have a smart approach when it comes to translating carbon neutral targets into your fleet. Um, I can imagine that um, the expectations of your top management relating to carbon neutral targets perhaps are not so easy to implement. And um, how can you convince your top management that for some countries, for some regions, it might be more challenging and that perhaps some of the timelines that they have set uh, are quite difficult to obtain? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question because this is all about the stakeholder management. Uh, because on the one side, you have the global stakeholders who are actually pushing to, to go further. And on the other side, you have local stakeholders and really top management who are saying, no, we're not able to do it now. So what we are doing actually currently, we are constantly as a company, we constantly do the market analysis specifically for different markets, where we assess on a regular basis the market maturity in terms of infrastructure, right? So this is the one thing which, which we can do on the external analysis. And to be honest, when I look at the older reports about the market maturity, uh, it's always about the charging points, about how the government supports, et cetera, et cetera. But I know that we as a company, we as a corporate, we can also influence this market maturity first by creating an opportunity for the employees to inbuild the home chargers, you know, to invest a little bit in the facility charger, charging points, et cetera, and also to create awareness. So that's what, what we are also doing, because that's where I agree actually with Carla. We need to create awareness. We need to prepare the audience for the electric vehicles before they start doing that. And that's also one of the uh, ways how we uh, approach our stakeholders on both sides. Okay, it's not going to happen now. It's impossible to do it today, but we should be aware that there is a roadmap and we need to start doing this already now. So there is always a timeline. Okay. Let's now continue with the second topic, which is related to connected fleets. Jonathan, uh, can I imagine that almost all vehicles within your fleet are already connected? So the, the answer would be no. <laughs> so we, we truly do not have a connected fleet, um, even just from a, a pure telematics perspective, because the origin of our fleet is sales related um, and there's a personal use benefit there's still a cultural piece for the organization that we have to 
work ourselves through um, before we can truly have a connected fleet. Okay. Um, don't you think that it would create multiple benefits to have that connected fleet, Jonathan? Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. The, the benefit isn't only to the organization, but it's, it's also to the, the employee who's driving the company vehicle, right? So all of the, the productivity that we can generate from that, the models that we could potentially change and how we get a market it is just pure benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they're the things that we're looking at. Okay. Um, Carlo, uh, Ericsson, uh, is of course also at the forefront when it comes to new technology. So I can imagine that you already have quite some vehicles that are equipped with telematics and that are connected. Is that correct? We have quite some vehicles, but the same uh, answer as Jonathan applies. Not all vehicles have been connected with telematics. Uh, we are inter indeed introducing telematics, especially into our uh, fields. Uh, fleet as to because we link that up to our dispatching uh, system or workforce management as we call it so we can actually better and efficiently manage our, our calls uh, trying to expand that further as well but when it uh, comes to indeed uh, benefit employees or sales reps uh, well we were facing some hurdles there and maybe in europe uh, related to gdpr um, what for you is let's say the must have or the most important benefit of telematics and connected technology for your fleet? Is it linked to safety? Is it linked to driver behavior, fuel efficiency? Is it cost driven? It's uh, well, multiple. I think it's a total cost of ownership perspective, real life accurate data, uh, giving you the opportunity to do significant improvements, uh, looking at idling, fuel consumption, operational efficiencies, uh, for sure, better planning possibilities when it comes to our field force, health and safety, and be on top of your uh, driving behavior. So prevent, be preventive and uh, re, uh, uh, proactive instead of reactive when the, the event already occurred. And of course, also from a carbon footprint perspective, because if you take real life data, you're also better in a better position to closely monitor your carbon footprint uh, emissions and to better steer on it. Mm -hmm. um, Julia, uh... I know that you already have some vehicles equipped with telematics, but I'm not sure if the telematics program and the connectivity program is guided and steered globally. Yes, it is not. You're correct. So it's really local initiatives in, in different countries where we basically uh, equip cars or we purchase cars already equipped with those sensors for two cars. So it's, uh, it's not related to benefit cars um, and it's not really guided. Um, uh, and the most, the most, the, the, the priority around this is really about the driver safety, I would say. Um, then if you look a little bit to the future, is there the intention at Danone to say like you did, for example, with carbon neutrality at that moment, at that point, we should have a complete connected fleet. Uh, yes, um, but we, we don't have the clear roadmap how to do that. We definitely know that we need to start doing this also from the global perspective, be it a globally led initiative or maybe just be, uh, be it a global team supporting with guidelines how to do so, maybe. Or maybe it's going to be a global tool because there are such, glo uh, such global tools which give you, you know, uh, proper visibility on your fleet and then you can, you can be even more efficient, not only about the driver efficiency, but not at this stage. So far, it's really uh, identified as a local initiative. Carlo, um, what do you miss from the supplier industry to make that connected fleet roadmap even more seamless than it is today and to make sure that you can in the future also connect your complete fleet? So this, you then refer more from a telematics perspective, uh, Stephen, okay. Yes. Um, well, I think it's a bit uh, the solutions. Uh, so. We do see uh, you want to have a, a unified implementation. So you want to have a global tool, the same setup, same system working. But also I think uh, looking at the car manufacturers, uh, it would be good in nowadays. We, nowadays we know that most cars are actually rolling out with some kind of telematics device pre-installed in the vehicle. I think it would be very helpful and that will be opened up to, to the market as well. And, and thus allowing a bit easier 
implementation of telematics into the world, where now you see you place a dongle yourself in the car, where actually a telematics device already available from a car manufacturer perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan, do you believe in autonomous technology? I do believe in, in uh, autonomous technology. I think we have um, a, a way to go to get there, uh, not just our organization, but um, from an industry perspective, right? There has to be trust at the end user level um, in autonomous vehicles. And that's going to take a really long time to get to, right? If, if we're having a conversation now about um, trust as it relates to telematics, what really is the opportunity from a trust perspective at the end user level when you talk about autonomous vehicles? Uh, Julia, is trust indeed one of the most important conditions to make autonomous technology work in the future? Oh yeah, absolutely. And especially, I mean, I always start thinking, uh, I always start for myself, you know, because would I step in now in the car without a pilot? No. <laughs> I really want to know first result of the pilot and then we will see so there is some certain steps to, to, to be made before that. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlo, I can imagine that if you have a tool fleet that it's perhaps uh, easier than when you have a passenger car fleet to start piloting with autonomous technology. Is that already on your radar? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, one step back, if you look at autonomous driving, there are, I think, total six levels of autonomous driving. And the first three, I think, are already in place, right? When, when, when we come to autonomous driving, I mean, it's uh, basic driver assistance or uh, advanced assistance systems, which are already helping us a lot. And that's your lane departure uh, warning systems and those kind of things in, when it comes to a health and safety perspective. When you want to take it to the step five and six, which are real autonomous driving, uh, we're, not, we're not piloting it yet in our uh, uh, fleet yet. And I think it's the same topic, with trust. Eh? We all have seen the, the, the press releases with the you know, Tesla cars that still uh, you know, were driving or hitting pedestrians. Um, but the, the developments are there, right? And in China and the US, I think they're uh, testing the environment. I think one part that's needed right now is to have connectivity in place, or actually uh, you need to have connected vehicles. Uh, to some kind of network with low uh, delays or latencies, we call it. And those things are being tested as we speak. And if they mature uh, and, and grow and the trust is getting there, then I think for sure it will be a, a very good um, what do you say, solution going forward. But we're not trialing it yet in our fleet, uh, Steve. But for sure, since we're a technology company, we will. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We need to end this panel discussion here. Thank you for the insights. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Carlo. And thank you, Jonathan. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of this global fleet conference. 